Hey AP students, I wanted to take this time to make a quick video on the HOTS thesis statement. HOTS stands for Higher Order Thinking Skills, and a thesis statement is a statement that is usually included at the beginning of an essay that basically sums up your argument. The HOTS thesis is not in your AP course, doesn't show up in Conexus at all. It only shows up in your lesson modifications. However, pretty much everything you turn in for your AP U.S. History course is going to need to use the HOTS. So I wanted to take a time to do something a little bit beyond the lesson modifications and walk through the HOTS in a quick little video just to see if that might help. So let's get into it. First things first, why do you do the HOTS thesis statement? It's limiting, it's constraining, which means the same thing. Uh, it can be time consuming, so why are we doing this? I write well, just let me write. Let me offer a short little analogy. In the 1970s, there was a filmmaker named George Lucas. He had this idea for a film that he called The Star Wars. All right? He couldn't take what was in his head and film it because he had limitations. He didn't have the money to do what he wanted to do. He didn't have the technology. The technology to take what he was imagining didn't exist in the 1970s. And he had a studio that was telling him, you have to shoot this many days and no, no further. You have to do this. You have to use this location, these actors. He was limited. And with those limitations, as frustrating as they were, he produced one of the greatest films of all time. All right, fast forward like 30 years. Okay, he decides he's going to make a prequel to his film. This time, though, he has no limitations. He is the studio. There is no one telling him what to do. He has all the money he could possibly want, and technology has caught up to his vision, so whatever he thinks, he can put on film. He has no limitations. And he made The Phantom Menace, which is widely reviled as being a subpar film. The little moral of that story, in case you're not a Star Wars fan, is that limitations are good. They force us to crystallize our argument. They force us to really think about what we're about to say. Think about doing a hot statement as doing a first draft. Making a hot statement is essentially doing a first draft for your paper or your short answer. There's another reason we do it. We do it because it's going to rack up some AP points in one sentence. It's going to show that you have a good answer. It's going to show that you can support that answer with appropriate facts. And it's going to show that you realize that there are alternate viewpoints to your answer. So you rack up right in the beginning. Bing, 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 bing. You rack up some points. Okay. Last reason we do the haunts is we're hoping an AP grader kind of glosses over everything else after they read the haunts. The HOTS basically tells an AP reader everything they could possibly want to, to know. They read that HOTS and they see, okay, you've got a good answer, you've got facts that support it, and hey, I can see that you actually know the complexity of history because you're including alternate viewpoints. So I'm going to read the rest of your essay, but really my mind is half somewhere else. So basically the HOTS is also a little trick. It's trying to get AP graders to go, yeah, they, these guys got it, I'm going to move on. So the HOTS is useful. So what is the HOTS? HOTS is a mathematic formula. X, however, A and B, therefore Y. It's a mathematical formula. Your job as a student is to take out the X, the A, the B, the Y, and replace them with phrases. And when I say replace them, I mean exactly that. Sometimes students struggle with, okay, I get the concept, and then they go, they go loose with the concept, and all of a sudden, instead of a sentence, they've got a paragraph because they're going, okay, I'm going to talk about an alternative viewpoint, I'm going to give some facts. I'm gonna... You actually do the exact formula. So if you take out the X, the A, the B, the Y, you actually wind up with something that looks exactly like blank, comma, however, blank, and blank, comma, therefore, blank. The commas, however, therefore, and, they don't move. You will have them in those spots in your answer. Again, it's limiting, it's constraining, but there's a reason we do that. So what does the formula stand for? Why is your answer? It is the answer to the question. A and B are facts that support 
your answer. And finally, x, and this is tricky, x is a fact that supports the opposite of your y. A lot of students want to take the x and just make it the opposite of their y. And when they do that, what they wind up with is a weird sentence that goes, uh, yes, however, a and b, therefore no. So they, they basically wind up saying two different things in their sentence. It's a fact that supports the opposite of the y. It's not a statement of the opposite of the y. Okay. So let me show you how to actually go about doing a Hunt's thesis sentence. So we'll take my handy dandy little eraser here and let's start off with a very generic question. Let's go with, is Mr. Hamrick a good teacher? That's, let's just go with that. Is Mr. Hamrick a good history teacher? How do we answer that? Okay. I always start with my why. I don't start trying to write this sentence directly. I always start with my why, and I always answer it as simply as I can. Is Mr. Hamrick a good history teacher? Yes. So I may actually just write that down. I put, okay, my why is yes. Cool. We can't leave it like that, though, obviously. I mean, obviously, we can't, we can't leave it there. So we have to make it fit the formula. So what I always do is I take that very simple answer and then I basically put the question into it and rephrase. So the formula is comma, therefore, and now let's put the question in, therefore, Mr. Hamrick is a good history teacher. All right. There we go. So we have our why. I mean, we, we've, we've got it. We've got our why. So now we've got our why. We've actually got it plugged into the formula and everything else. We've got our why. Awesome. Now let's move on to our A and B. Why did we just say that? A and B. So again, why is Mr. Hammer a good history teacher? Okay. An A. One fact. Um, he tells interesting history stories. That could be our A. And our B could be his live lessons are very engaging. Awesome. Now let's plug them into the formula. Okay. So we know our, a, our formula needs to be however. So let's just go ahead and plug this in with comma. However, he tells interesting stories and his live lessons are engaging. All right, now we've got our, our A and our B. However, he tells interesting uh, stories and his live lessons are engaging. So now all we have left is our X. We always finish with our X. Okay, what's our Y? Our Y is Mr. Hamrick is a good history teacher. So let's flip that. Mr. Hamrick is not a good history teacher. Okay, what would support that statement? We don't remember, we don't write just the opposite. We don't write, Mr. Hamrick is a bad history teacher, however, he tells interesting stories and his live lessons are engaging, therefore Mr. Hamrick is a good history teacher. We don't write that, because that doesn't make sense. We flip our Y, and then we ask what would support it. Therefore, Mr. Hamrick is a bad history teacher. All right, what would support that? I talk very fast. Sometimes I talk too fast to be understood that would support that I'm a bad teacher. I talk too fast to be understood. Okay, that's our X. Before we write our X, however, let's consider one thing. Let's consider that um, this is the first thing, this is the first phrase someone sees, so it has to have some detail to it. We can't just say he, because the readers don't know what we're talking about. We do because we, we wrote it here in our Y, but remember the Y is the end. So our X also has to include enough scene setting 
for someone to understand it. So, okay, so here's our x. Our x is going to be, let's just go ahead, I'm going to write it down here. Our x is going to equal, I'm going to say, Mr. Hamrick talks too fast to be easily understood. So now we have all of our pieces. So what I do on my paper, I then write down, Mr. Hamrick talks too fast to be easily understood, comma. However, he tells interesting stories and his live lessons are engaging, comma. Therefore, Mr. Hamrick is a good history teacher. That's our hots. So what's some tips to, to think about as you're writing the hots? One, you know it's going to take some time, but that's okay because it's a good exercise. Two, you always ask yourself, does someone need to know this now, or can someone know this in the body paragraphs? Remember, this is just our first, you know, our first sentence. This is our thesis. You've got a whole essay to further explain these things. So always ask yourself, and this is what a lot of students do. They, if they're turning in just a hot thesis sentence, they tend to want to explain everything. So they use parentheticals. Uh, they use a lot more commas. They're like, I've got to explain, I've got to explain. It's like, no, you actually don't. As long as this is clear, you're giving a good heads up for the rest. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, what we do like is we do like specificity in our X, our A, and our B. And what I mean by that is not like a lot of detail. What I mean by specificity is it's always better to use a proper noun instead of a generalized statement. So, for instance, for instance, um, instead of saying the economic system in the United States wasn't good, which is a very generalized statement, you say the Great Depression had hit the United States. You're really saying the same things, but in one you're using a proper noun, the Great Depression, and the other you're saying a more generalized statement. So the more you can use a proper noun in your X, your A, and your B, the better off you are. So remember, proper nouns. All right. You might be thinking, okay, this takes me so much time. I'm on a time limit here, Hamrick. I'm on a time schedule here. How am I supposed to write the rest of the essay if this took me half? Well, here's the great news. The great news is this is your pre-writing. This is your outline. So if you're writing a... If you're writing a, uh, let's go ahead and erase this. If you're writing an essay, okay, let's say you're writing an essay, and you've got your, you know, you've got your hot thesis sentence with an X, uh, A, and a B, and a Y. You just have your outline, because your first paragraph winds up being your hots. You know, your hot thesis is your first paragraph, so it's already written. What's your second paragraph? you go ahead and you expand on your A. All those things you kind of felt like you needed to say in a hot sentence, you say it and a little bit more in a second paragraph. Your third paragraph becomes about your B. You expand on your B fact, you give some analysis. Your fourth paragraph, I think you're gonna see where I'm going here, expands on your X, you know, expands on. However, there's another way to look at this. Here it is, and here's why it's not as, um, as solid as my A and my B. And finally, with your five, your fifth paragraph, you just restate your why. You take your why and definitely state it. Boom, that's your essay. So your hot sentence gives you your essay outline. Now, what if you're doing a short answer? You're like, okay, I'm doing a short answer. Awesome. Same thing apply, only instead of these being paragraphs, they become sentences. Your first sentence is your hots. Your second sentence is more on the A. Your third sentence is more on your B. Fourth more on the X. Fifth more on the Y. Okay. So that is a quick look at the hot thesis sentence. Is it difficult? Yes. Is it constraining? Yes. Especially for good writers, this can be frustrating. It's frustrating for me as a teacher because I can't easily come up with, you know, students go, well, how can I do this better? I actually have to work at it to make it better. I can't just, boom, pump it out. But that's, that's a good thing. It's always, I think I've said this on, on a couple students with their feedback, it's always that next pass of the hots that you're aiming for. It's that pass that really renders it down to your crystallized argument. This, however, this and this, therefore this. Boom, 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 boom. 
you know? And the more you go through the haunts and the more you pare things away, the more you realize, oh, this really is kind of the, the crystals, crystallized form of my argument. This is what's important. And you know what that does? It keeps you from going off the reservation on these things. Once you start writing your paragraphs, you're not going down tangents. You're not going down false trails because you're think basically what happens when you kind of write an essay a traditional way, even with pre-writing, is you're, you're thinking it through as you're writing. Well, all the thinking has actually happened here. So you'll get an AP essay that's basically, boom, it's perfect. It's like the perfectly written, perfectly thought out answer. All right. So that's the Hotz thesis statement. You're using it all the time unless I tell you you're not. And every now and then there's something where I say, for this, don't use the Hotz thesis. Just tell me, tell me an answer. That's very rare. The Hotz thesis is everywhere. It's in a DBQ. It's in a long essay. The Hotz thesis is basically everywhere. So there are no questions, comments, or screams of angst. I hope this video helped.